listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. Our radio website, where you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, as well as the live show from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight, Monday through Friday, is www.exxonradiotv.com. And our new podcast site, Exxon Podcast. Dot com. My guest this hour is a good friend of the X-Zone, Linnea Starr is her name, and she has displayed an amazing metaphysical understanding of the universe since her early childhood. When Linnea was a little girl, her grandmother remarried. On the day of the wedding, Linnea was upstairs near grandmother's new home. Several pictures and portraits hung on the wall. Now, a woman appeared and told Linnea that she was the mother in one of the pictures. She further explained that her name was Mary and that she died before Linnea was born. Mary also stated that her spine was healed. Mary wanted everyone to know that she knew her children now had a mother here on earth. Linnea's grandmother came upstairs and asked who she had been talking with. When Linnea told her, her grandmother related that her new husband's late wife was named Mary and that she had died from cancer of the spine before Linnea was born. We've had the pleasure of having Linnea on the show many times. She is loved by all of our listeners around the world. Her website is LinneaStar.com, and uh, joining me now is Linnea Star. And Linnea, always great having you on the show. How have you been, dear friend? Fine, thank you so much. Uh, excitement to be on your show tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share my message that the soul is eternal. Thank you again. Oh, it's our great pleasure, Linnea. You know that we love having you with us. Um, Linnea, one of the many topics that we talk about here on the X-Zone is reincarnation. Can you tell us about reincarnation and how it works? Yes, I can. Reincarnation is the ability of your soul spirit to come back in another lifetime. And there are many religions that do believe in this. Actually, the Hindu faith and the Buddhist faith are very much aficionados of the facts that the soul spirit can come back. Mm -hmm. There have been some documentations of that um, throughout the world, and I'm a believer that if the soul spirit connection is that strong to the survivors, somehow the soul will find a way to come back into everyone's life again. It could come back as a relative, it could come back as a child, so I'm often um, aware of situations where that could possibly happen, even in a non-Hindu or non-Buddhist setting. Lene, how many times does one person come back? Uh, maybe the right way to ask the question is, how many times are we reincarnated? I think that we choose if and when we want to come back, and I think it's because we haven't learned the lessons on the earth plane that we were supposed to learn during our lifetime. And I think that there are some souls that want to come back and have another chance. Mm -hmm. And a way to ascertain this is sometimes young children will start to speak of a past life connection. And especially, as I said, in the Hindu and the Buddhist faith, a lot of times the family will research this to find out if it's actually applicable. So you should watch your little ones. They might give you cues or clues. They might know information about their family history or families that you're connected to that they mm. wouldn't have unless it was the soul spirit returning. Are children more apt to remember their past lives 
due to the fact that they haven't been in this existence or this reality for very long? That's a really good observation, and I think because they're so young Mm -hmm. and open, they don't have a filter to prevent that from happening. It just seems by the age of reason, seven or eight years of age, those memories are clouded and they're not readily available as they are when the child is a little bit younger. Fascinating topic, fascinating lady. My guest this hour is Linnea Starr. Her website is www.linneastar.com. That's L-I-N-N-E-A-S-T-A-R.com. Now, Linnea and I have to take a small break here for our good sponsors and friends of the Exxon. But when we come back, we're going to be talking to Linnea about much more, including prophecies, re, uh, uh, ghost apparitions, miracles, and much more. This hour here in the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell, and our special guest, our good friend Linnea Starr. This is the Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as you will soon see on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Linnea Starr is my guest this hour, ExoNation. LinneaStar.com is her website. And Linnea, is there any way for someone to know how many times they have been reincarnated? I'm going to say that I think that that um, could be a possibility if the family that you are reincarnated again will document some of your past escapades. And I think sometimes Mm -hmm. if there's been more than one reincarnation, the soul spirit will give information that can be validated. But you have to really, I think, hone in on what the child might be telling you or some of the instances that the child might have a genetic memory that nobody um, would assume unless the child brought it up themselves. It really has to be keyed in to your relationship with the person that has come back to reconnect with you. You said in the previous uh, segment we were talking about reincarnation, and you mentioned the soul-spirit connection. Can you describe that, please? Yeah, I'm going to say that um, all of us have a human body, as you know, or, you know, an animal body, and that body is given the life force which I consider to be called the soul spirit. It's almost like an electrical force. And when your soul spirit is going to leave the body and the body is no longer necessary, your soul spirit or your energy, per se, will go back to the Creator, and you will either decide to you know, travel on and learn what you can learn on the other side, heaven, nirvana, or you'll stay close to the people that were close to you and be like a guardian angel in some instances. And in some instances, you might decide to come back because the love connection was very strong and you want to recreate mm-hmm. a relationship with the family that you left behind. Is, is it possible, Linnea, that that we don't come back to the same family, that we don't come back in the same dimension, the same reality. It's possible that we may even come back on another planet in a far-off galaxy. I think I can agree with that because there have been instances where someone has come back, but they were not connected to the family that they're in, but they've given definitive information from another lifetime that's been verified, and that's called genetic memory. And sometimes we will meet someone that we have such a strong intrinsic connection to, and we don't understand why. Mm -hmm. They're not related. We didn't really plan this. But genetic memory is letting you know that you have a genetic imprint on each other, and you knew each other in another um, existence. Are there a set number of souls, for example? Are more souls created as time goes on, or are are they the same souls that... Are, are recycled, for lack of better words. I would say that my, my own feeling is that the soul is created in the image and likeness of, of what you perceive as God. Mm-hmm. And I would think that even if you do come back, there are new souls, souls that are being constantly 
you know, returned and given life to, to, to the body. So I'm going to say I think it's a combination. You could have people coming back, but I think that it's a whole new um, consistent soul spirit keeps, you know, keeps producing more and more individuals. I don't think it's the same ones coming back. I think that's few and far between, but I think that when God is creating the world, Mm -hmm. he's sending soul people, you know, souls into bodies to become individuals to have their lifespan, usually about, what, 70 years, four score and 10. How does it work? lucky. How does it work with channels who ask uh, a medium to connect with someone on the other side. What happens if that someone on the other side has already been reincarnated? Is there still is there still a a a a portion of this soul that is able to communicate with the loved one on this side? Well, I think that whoever is the medium channeling would be able to get information to point to that. There was a very famous gentleman Edgar Casey mm-hmm. who was the sleeping prophet. And he would, you know, go into a trance and give information. And sometimes he would say, the energy is not available. Another lifetime has been um, acclimated. So I think there are instances where you might be able to tell someone, I can't get the connection I want that's telling me that that the person has returned to the earth plane. How do you know? I've had that happen to me a few times. You have, eh? Yes, I have. I've had that happen a few times. How does somebody know who is seeking that reconnection? They're grieving so bad they want to reconnect with a loved one that has departed. How do they know if a medium is legitimate or not? That's a very good observation also. And I think that when you do go to someone who purports to be, you know, a connection, Mm -hmm. you need to check their credentials. You need to look at the website. You need to get some kind of verbal affirmation if someone's been there or if you've heard, you know, um, testimonials from people. And the other thing is when you meet the medium, if they start to give you evidentiary information, if they start to give you cues that do mean something, I'm going to say that I would go with the feeling that they're picking up the energy around you and henceforth they're trying to give you what the spirit world is trying to, to say so you can substantiate that it's the person you're trying to make the connection with. You have to feel comfortable doing it because if you don't work with the person Mm -hmm. that's giving you the information, sometimes you can put a blockage up through no fault of your own, but you really have to be conducive to letting the energy come through so the medium can communicate with you and the person on the other side. Is it possible that when someone is channeling, like you channel, you're a medium, right? Yes, I okay. am. Thank you. I am. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you prevent a negative entity who may be masquerading as the person that the soul that you are trying to communicate with from coming through back onto this side? I understand because I've had people ask me that also. I think what I generally do, I know I do. I always ask for protection. I ask for the white light, Mm -hmm. and I ask to be connected to the highest possible level of communication that I can, you know, do. And the thing is that if I have any hesitancy, if I feel I shouldn't be connecting there, I will end the session. I'm not comfortable with it. I've had that happen. So it's almost like I know, yeah, I know instinctively that, you know what, um, this isn't something that I think I want to pursue. This isn't going to help anyone. And I think that I would rather go on to something else and just leave that particular channel alone. Because sometimes you're right. Sometimes you have to be able to ascertain that it's not the most positive force that might be using your ability to give a message to someone. And you want to prevent anything unpleasant or untrue to come through. You want the highest level of white light. That's what I think everyone in this field would want. I know especially I do. Speaking about uh, the negative forces, how dangerous is a Ouija board with people who don't know what they're doing? Well, the Ouija board has been around for a long time, and it's um, the word Ouija. We is French for yes, and ja is yes in German, I believe. And it is technically something that you can use to connect to the other side. I stay away from it. 
I'm not comfortable with it because there have been cases where something unpleasant Mm -hmm. has come through that people didn't know how to handle. So I always suggest that you get an angel board. They make something now called an angel board that's a little bit more on the light side, more spiritually oriented, and I would rather have people use that rather than the Ouija board because the Ouija board has had instances where things came through that were not the most pleasant things. There is a very famous instance with a Ouija board, and it is called um, the Pearl Curran situation, C-U-R-R-A-N. Pearl Curran began to use a Ouija board, and she got into contact with an entity from the 1800s, and the woman's name was Patience Worth, W-O-R-T-H. And it went on from Ouija board to automatic writing, and uh, Mrs. Curran was able to write several books based on this uh, entity coming through to her, and she became quite a profound author. She became quite wealthy from her work, so that was a very positive instance with the Ouija board, but there are some documented cases where things got out of hand and people got very upset about it, so I always advise that you use a, a spirit board, an angel board, rather than the, the original Ouija board. I was speaking to a gentleman this afternoon who said that his his daughter and boyfriend were playing with a Ouija board, and ever since they were they were did a séance with the Ouija board, that he feels as if he is being attacked by demonic forces. And he said that he's gone to uh, the church. He's tried to find someone who could help him get rid of this this energy. The, this this he calls it a demon. Uh, four demons that apparently have come through the the wall, but there's just this one demon that he believes is from someone on his mother's side that keeps on attacking him. When something like this happens, what what should people do, Linnea? You know, I've had people ask me about that, and especially when there's minors involved, you mm-hmm. know, um, younger people or someone that's... Um, maybe a teenager or under that poltergeist activity, my first response is to always go to a clergyman, either a rabbi, a minister, or a priest, and I would have my house blessed. I would have that individual come in with holy water or, you know, incantations to purge the area, and I would um, immediately get rid of the um, Ouija board in question. You can either bury it or you can burn it in the backyard. But I would say that I would seek counsel on clergy because they would immediately know how to ascertain what this is and how to get rid of it. And I would um, applaud the man for going to have this religious situation, helping him. There's no other way out of it. You really need a clergy person's attention to that. You know, I've got to take a commercial break for the news in in about a minute, but I will tell you what he said. He said that he had uh, three members of of the clergy come into his house. All they did was they blessed the house, put some, used some uh, holy water, and they would not go into the room where this demonic entity s- does all the attacking. Okay. Yeah. Strange. Then it was pretty powerful. Yeah. So I hope he's okay. Linnea, I hope they're all right. You and I will talk more on the other side of this commercial break. Exonation Nation, Linnea Starr sure. is our special guest, Star. Dot com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And Linnea and I will be back on the other side of this news break. Don't go away. Listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond.
Linnea Starr is my guest, ExoNation, www.LinneaStarr.com. Linnea, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in angels? I do, and I was actually going to kind of segue into that part of this, because guardian angels are very important in every religion. Guardian angels are given to Mm -hmm. each person that's born on the earth plane, and they kind of guide you through your good times and your bad. And I would like to say that you can petition your guardian angel to guide you in times of stress. You can petition your guardian angel to help you when you're in a situation of great danger. And I wanted to mention a prayer petition. A prayer petition is often used to either help somebody who is physically ill, emotionally ill, or having some really difficult life circumstances. And what you do is you pick a saint that you feel you might have a connection to, like St. Jude, St. Bernadette of Lourdes, St. Catherine Labore, and you petition the saint to help you in a situation. And when you get your answer, whether it's a yes or a no, it's not always yes, unfortunately, then you make a small donation to the saint's cause, and that's called a prayer petition. And I've been involved with a lot of clients that will petition a particular saint, and we seem to have some great success with some medical issues. There have been some issues with children and a few adults where they came out of the medical illness after we petitioned the saints that, you know, they felt comfortable with. So I do feel your guardian angels and your saints around you can help you through any kind of dire circumstances. I had a guest on the show last week who tried to tell me, and I'm using the word try here because I didn't buy it at all, that angels were cosmic demons. The archangels were cosmic demons. Can you believe that? Okay. Well, I'm going to say that's a little far-fetched. and I mean, I know there's good and bad on both sides, but Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that I have to say that I feel angels are divine revelations. I don't really think they're anything that wouldn't be divine. And there is a great website out there. It's called incorruptbodiesofsaints. Dot com. Right. And if people can take a chance and look at that, you'll see about 400 um, Catholic saints that were unearthed to um, make them, to canonize them, and several of them were not uh, decayed. Their bodies did not decay despite being buried for over 100 years and not being embalmed. Linnea, so what, was the, what, was, bodies of saints. what was the body, uh, what was the name of the website again, dear? Yes, it's incorrupt, I N C O R R U P T. Incorrupt Bodies of Saints, and there's about 400 of them, okay. and two of them I actually mentioned tonight, Bernadette of Lourdes and Catherine Labore. Uh, St. Catherine Labore died in 1876, and they unearthed her in 1900 to canonize her as a saint. Her body is intact, and it lies in state in a uh, glass casket in Paris, France. You can go in and see She's absolutely completely pure with no wow. uh, decay, as is St. Bernadette. And when you look at something like that, I did see Catherine Labore myself, you're amazed because here is a woman that died over 100 years ago, and she's in perfect physical condition. It's got to be a miracle from God. I agree with you. Why I, why I mentioned this other guest I had on, Person, because, right? when, because something inside me just clicked when she when she tried to tell the Exo Nation that archangels were cosmic demons, it was just like an attack on everything that I believe is good. Sacred, I know. I'm wondering. I don't know if she had a bad experience, or there was something she was taught that was you know something mm-hmm. that was misconception. But my conception of anything with an angel connection would always be holy, always would be spiritual, and always would be beneficial to all humans, not just believers. You know, angels have, um, from time immemorial, shown up to save somebody from an accident or prevent the accident from happening, or they appear to little children. And I'm going to say that I would have to agree with you. I think she might have some kind of misconception about exactly what an angel is composed of. So all I did was I sent her love and light. That's all I could do. And you can't do anything else. Yeah. You're right. What can you t- What can you tell us about? Um, I was looking at the list you sent us, and magician Harry Houdini. What's the story on Houdini? 
Yes, Harry Houdin, fascinating gentleman. And he became a magician early in his life, Mm -hmm. and he was an escape artist. He could get out of any contraption that would put him in. And um, he was very devoted to his mother and to his father. And he always promised the father, I will take care of my mother no matter where I am. And the father passed away, and a few years later, Houdini was in um, Europe doing a magic show, and his mother took sick, and she died before he could get home. He was heartbroken. So he began to go to mediums to try to connect with his mother, and at that point in time, the early 1900s, he would go to a lot of spiritual people, spiritual, um, the spiritual church. He went into one person to speak to this person, and they made the sign of the cross. And they put a cross on a piece of paper, and Harry Houdini was enraged. He was an Orthodox Jewish gentleman. His father was a rabbi. And he said, my mother would never send me a cross. So he actually went on a big rampage to show who was a fraud and who wasn't. And he was pretty successful. And he was able to, you know, expose a lot of people for what they were not. Mm -hmm. And sadly, he was um, injured in 1928, I believe, on Halloween. Somebody punched him in the stomach, and he had not had a chance to tense his muscles up, and he died of peritonitis. But before he died, he said to his wife, I will give you a code, and if I can come back to you through a medium, this is what I will say. So she is the only one who knew that. And about three years later, she attended a group with a medium called Arthur Ford, F-O-R-D. And Arthur Ford came through the audience and said to her, I have a message for you. He did not know her. And he said, Rosabelle, Rosabelle, pray tell Rosabelle. That was the secret message that Houdini gave his wife before he died. Mrs. Houdini was overjoyed, and she you know, publicized her connection. And Arthur Ford became very, very well known because of Mrs. Houdini's um, publishing, publishing. She also took out an affidavit. Now, at the very end of their relationship, um, Mrs. Houdini was elderly at the time and not well. And Arthur Ford said to Mrs. Houdini, I need to ask you this. He said, there's a very lovely woman behind you with white hair, and she says, forgive. And Mrs. Houdini said, that was my mother-in-law. She had a huge crown of white hair all up in a a, a large bun. And she always said to um, Houdini and his wife, if I can come back to the both of you, Mm -hmm. the word that I will use is forgive. So Arthur Ford was able to get those two beautiful connections, and I think Houdini's spirit hopefully rests in peace because his wife was able to get the secret code that he only shared with her. Fascinating story. Fascinating story. But I also understand, Linnea, that Sir Winston Churchill also had psychic abilities, and everybody knows Sir Winston Churchill as the Prime Minister of Great Britain during... Of England, Of right? England during World, World War, War II. II, yeah. And what happened was, on two occasions, um, he was actually riding in the chauffeured limo with the driver, and he said to the driver, I'm going to sit up front with you. And the gentleman said, but you shouldn't. And he said, I have to. They turned the corner on 10 Downing Street, and somebody threw a Molotov cocktail in the back seat, and the back of the car blew up. If Churchill had been in the back seat, he would have been killed. Now, a few months later, he was giving a um, political dinner at his house, and he came into the kitchen for no reason, and he ordered the servants to go to their quarters. And they did. And about 10 minutes later, somebody threw a Molotov cocktail oh in the back gosh. of his house, and, and the back of the house burned down. So two occasions, and people would say to him, what, why are you doing this? He said, I get a feeling. He said, and I hear danger, mm-hmm. and I know that I have to have, I have to be in control. So he didn't really publicize it, obviously, because, you know, he was the prime sure. minister, and maybe that would have made him look a little um, ridiculous. But those two um, situations are, are written down, and they're documented. And I'm quite sure you've heard of the Titanic. Oh, Everyone definitely. Has. Sure, yeah. Yes, and the Titanic sunk, as you know, on April 15th of 1912, and it was supposed to be unsinkable. It was the largest um, vessel, and it was going from England to New York on its maiden voyage. And there was a, a terrible loss of life, as you know. It hit an iceberg. Yeah. Well, in 19, in, sorry, excuse me, in 1898, Morgan Robertson wrote a book called The Titan, T-I-T-A-N, and it was about the biggest um, 
ship ever created. It was going on its maiden voyage from England to New York, and it sunk in April of that year, and it was a large loss of life after it hit an iceberg. This whole story about the Titan was completely fiction. It had nothing to do with the Titanic. It was written before the Titanic was built. And that's called synchronicity, something of a coincidence like that happens. Nobody can explain it, but the Titan came out in 1898, and the Titanic sunk, the real Titanic, I'm sorry, the Titan in 1898, and the real Titanic sunk in 1912. So a lot of people call that an unsolved mystery. How did that happen? It's called synchronicity. This world of ours is filled with mysteries, and, you know, I believe that most of the mysteries, and I'm using the word most, will be solved at one time or another. However, there are those that will never be solved. And I think that when it comes to what we were talking about with Sir Winston Churchill, Harry Houdini, and of course the Titanic, these are mysteries that will not be solved. Not in this lifetime, Not maybe. In this lifetime. Maybe eons down the road. But you're right. There are some things that I think are mysterious mm-hmm. and they're meant to be mysterious. And I don't think we're going to get answers as humans until we get to the other side ourselves. And then I think all the answers are crystal clear. In all the work that you've done over the years and the many, many people that you've met doing the work that you do, is there one case that stands out above the rest? Yeah, I'm going to say that I think the ones that I do, thank you for asking, I think the ones that I do with the children, Mm -hmm. children on the other side, children that come back to me, and I had an instance where um, a a little girl, she was probably about two, she came back to me and prophesied the birth of her brother, and the family was very much bereft after losing her naturally through an illness, and I found out down the road that, indeed, there had been a baby boy born a year or so later. Unexpected, but a total joy. And I told the family, the little girl was showing me an angel's kiss. And an angel's kiss is either, it's a little pink mark that some children get on the forehead, on oh, the yeah. side of the neck, or mm-hmm. on the ear. And this baby that was born, this little brother that came along, had a little pink mark on his forehead. And the family took that to be that the little girl had kissed him before he came to the earth plane. So that was really wonderful. When I do the baby prophecies and they come true, that's very heartwarming because the child wasn't there. And then lo and behold, the child's here. And I usually get the gender Mm -hmm. and I usually get the due date. In some instances, I've gotten the name. Um, I've predicted about 2,000 children in the last 10 years and they're all here. And I've seen the families again, and I've predicted mm-hmm. sometimes even more than one child in different families. But I think for the baby to come back to say that she lives on, I think that gave a lot of comfort to the parents, especially when the little boy was born, because it was their daughter that told them about it. Whenever you and I have talked, I always notice that your tone changes when you talk about children. It's it's you've got a very loving voice. Don't take me wrong, but when you start oh, talking, thank you. Thank when, you, you. when you start talking about children, the love just pours out. And is this because is this because Linnea that you as a child had your gift open up, and is this your way of trying to help other children on this side or the other side to let them know that there's more to to what we believe to be existence than there really is? I think you've you've hit a chord that's very, very important. I think that um, when I've done work with children, I've worked with children that have had bereavements, and when I've worked with children from the other side, that vibration is very pure Mm -hmm. and very innocent and very spiritual, and they're not old enough to have a filter on the other side and also on this side. And recently I saw a little girl that lost her father. She's nine years old. And what can I say to someone that lost their father? And we took a picture of her. She's a very pretty little kid. And on the bottom of her eyelashes, there were all these little blue tears. You could see them. And she said, what is that? I said, that's daddy. Your daddy telling you he knows about your tears when you go to sleep at night and they're blue for heaven. And the kid was just so emotional. She said, I can see them. I said, I know. I said, that's your daddy putting those 
little blue dots on your eyelashes. He doesn't want you to cry. So I'm going to say I think you're right. With the children, there's no filter, and I recognize that, and I think my gift responds more so because I know it's going to be well-received, and I'm going to get the information that the child needs for me to communicate or for me to give them the information from the loved one on the other side when they are children here on the earth plane. Children, I love kids. I yeah, do. I can, I can certainly tell that. Um, children who talk to invisible friends, how do you deal with the parents? Because I know a lot of parents aren't as open as you and I are. When our children had invisible friends or, you know, they had their make-believe friends, we, we encouraged it. A lot of parents think this I think is you wrong. Should. I, think, yeah. I know. I think you're right because if you do encourage it, the child feels comfortable. The child doesn't feel stressed. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that sometimes the imaginary friend will disappear, and sometimes the child will make the connection that it was a grandmother, mm -hmm. an uncle, a granddad, and that will come out if the family's comfortable with what the children are doing. I often tell people that have kids that see that, again, I refer them to a clergyman because I feel that the clergy person can deal with the parents on a, on a spiritual level and assure them that, you know, this is something, it's normal, it's not anything to be afraid of, it's a, a connection from a loved one on the mm -hmm. other side. And I find that happens in houses, old houses where children reside. The original ghost or the apparition that might have been there years ago responds to the new family. It responds to the family um political connection, mother, father, children. Right. And so you'll get a very you'll get a very benevolent presence that doesn't want to leave because this energy is reminiscent of what they had when they walked the earth plane. They might be stuck in between dimensions. They don't know how to get over there. But I tell the family, if you're comfortable with it and this this soul spirit seems to be genuine and gentle, I would say to the soul spirit, we want you to stay here. You're a part of us as long as, you know, it's pleasant and benevolent. You don't want anything there that isn't pleasant or benevolent. Linnea, stand so by. Pick we, up on that. Linnea, we've okay. got to take our final break. Please stand by. Exonation. Linnea Star is our guest. LinneaStar.com. We'll be back. Don't go away. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Exonation Linnea Star is our guest this hour, www.linneastar.com. First of all, Linnea, always great talking to you, my friend. I love the way that, that you help people. It's wonderful. And and you and I were talking during the last break about a friend of yours who who needs our help. Our prayers. She does. She's having some... Yes, Bobby Joe from Boston is battling some serious medical issues, but I told her that I would throw it out to your listeners for a prayer. And if they can say a little prayer like Aretha Franklin did in that beautiful song... All our energy will work, and my friend will recover and, and be restored to good health. I thank you for that. Well, you tell your friend, Bobby Joe, that she has a lot of friends now in the Exo Nation, and we're all going to pray, pray for her and send her love and light. I will do that, and thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. Well, we're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. we got about three, oh, okay, more, we cool. got about three more minutes. What's the, oh, okay. What's the truth about aliens? You know, I think that there is something to this. If you look uh -huh. at Roswell, and if you look at some of the um, documentations like Betty and Barney Hill in the 60s in New Hampshire, and it seems to follow a common theme. They have the same descriptions, the same uh, reactions, the same audio and visual, um, not hallucinations, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say moments. Right. I think there's something out there, and I think that as... We do more space travel. I think we're going to find that there could be life on other planets. And I would like that because I think we could all work together in conjunction to learn from each other and to promote intergalactic or peace, which would be great, like our own Star sure. Wars, but no war. It would be really nice for everyone on this planet to get on the same team. Wouldn't it? Yeah. What's I your, hope. <laughs> what, is your what is your final message tonight, Leonea, for the members of the Exxon Nation? 
I want to thank everyone, especially you and your wonderful organization, for allowing me oh. to give the message that the soul spirit is eternal and to be open to it. You know, you don't have to be an ardent believer like we are, mm-hmm. but you can just be tuned into it and to look for the experience and to let your soul spirit loved ones from the other side come and communicate because the grave is not the end. The grave is the beginning of eternal life. We find everybody on the other side when it's our time to go to glory. I believe you, and I I agree. I I have often used this analogy that as someone is getting ready to leave this side, whether it's natural causes, whether it's uh, a disease, whether it's an accident, they enter the cocoon stage, just like a butterfly. And when they come Uh out of the other side, the metamorphosis has taken place. In this case, it's from a a spirit in a human body to a free spirit. Not unlike the butterfly who goes in as a caterpillar and comes out as a butterfly. That's right. And I think, too, if you um, look at all religions, no matter what religion we believe in, Mm -hmm. every religion tells you there's something after this. And I think that if we all believe that, And we are in the reality that, you know what, they watch over us with light and love. No one is ever lost. Lenny Estar, thank you so much for joining us again. I look forward to the next time you come back here and visit us in the X-Zone. Thank you, me too, and talk soon. Take care. And and please, don't forget to let Bobby Jo know that we're all sending her love and light in our prayers. It's wonderful. I will tell her, and thank you again. Take care. Take care, my friend. Exo Nation, Linnea Starr has been our guest this hour, www.LinneaStar.com. I'll be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exo. So until tomorrow night, my friends, always remember to keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone. <laughs>